What's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. Now this video has been very long awaited. You guys always request that I cover serial killers, but I always just have this weird complex with it. And I accidentally stumbled upon this one. So if you're not familiar with Crime After Crime, it's a podcast that I co-host with John Lorden, another true crime YouTuber. And our topic for August was criminal doctors. And I was shocked to my core at some of the stories that I was finding. And I stumbled into a serial killer named Charles Cullen, also known as things like the angel of death and all these other nicknames he was given and I knew that I had to cover him on my channel. What this man did changed laws and I think 37 possibly more states but before I really dive into the nitty gritty of this case I want to say a massive massive thank you to Audible for sponsoring today's video. Now if you aren't aware of what Audible is and you haven't heard me rave about it numerous times in the past it is my favorite resource when it comes to audiobooks that I use for my research on cases just like this one. However, they also have original audio shows, they have news, they have comedy. If you want to listen to, you know, other nonfiction or fiction true crime, they have that. If you need some inspirational words to start off your day, or if you just need some entertainment while you're at the gym busting your booty on the stairs, like myself, they have an unmatched selection, so there's definitely going to be something for you. Now, I personally have been listening recently to a book called The Good Nurse by Charles Graber. That book is essentially the best source of information on today's case and I will kind of dive more into it later on in the video. I have never been this glued to a book before, probably in my entire life. When it comes to Charles Cullen, this particular serial killer, he wouldn't speak to anyone at his trial. He would not say any words to his victims, families. He completely shut down after everything happened. And Charles Graber is actually one of the very first people that he spoke to when he was in prison. And no one really knows why, but it gave Charles a great upper hand and you get to see so many behind the scenes extra details within this book about this entire story that I could not find anywhere else in my research. So if you guys want to listen to this book, which I highly suggest, there's no way I ever could have gotten into every single detail from the book in this one particular video. So if you guys wanna listen along with me, all you have to do is go to www.audible.com forward slash Danielle or text Danielle to 500 500 and that will start your exclusive 30 day free trial with Audible. You will receive one free audiobook so you can listen to The Good Nurse by Charles Graber. You also will have a choice of two free Audible originals. All of that information will be linked down below and it also will be up on the screen just to make sure that you guys don't miss it. Now I can dive into today's actual case and I don't even know where to begin. Normally I have a very good intro going for the cases that I cover. I have no words for this case. The book was incredible. I feel like you get to see a serial killer at a level that I've personally never been able to look into them before. You get to see what his life was like from the second he was born on and kind of what molded him and, you know, turned him into this cold-blooded killer. It is absolutely insane. I do want to warn you that it is very graphic. So if that's something that's going to bother you, definitely err on the side of caution. Um, it's a rough one to get through, but I would not have any of this information if it weren't for the good nurse, the books. So let's go ahead and start with Charles' early life because I honestly think that's exactly where all of these problems started. So Charles was born into an Irish Catholic family and he was the youngest of eight children born in 1960. And yes, you heard me right, eight children. His life was chaotic, 
Their whole family's life was chaotic and complicated to say the least. Charles was not a planned baby. They did not have a lot of money. Um, they were really worried about how they were going to take care of them, how they were going to afford him. But that ended up being the least of their issues because within seven months of Charles being born, his father died unexpectedly. And this left his mother with eight children and she was having to figure it all out on her own. I will say majority of his siblings had moved out by the time he came around. He was much, much younger than all of his siblings, but they seemed to find a way to come back again and again and again. Many of his brothers were heavily addicted to drugs. They sold drugs out of the bedrooms upstairs in the home. Um, his sisters would come and spend time in the house again when they unexpectedly became pregnant. Oftentimes, their boyfriends would come and stay with them. And unfortunately, these men were not great people. They were very large, aggressive, terrible people for Charles to be around. They would bully him and hurt him physically. And it just wasn't a great experience for him growing up. And this led to two events that would become a pattern for the rest of Charles' life. He had attempted to poison one of his sister's boyfriends with lighter fluid at one point. This is how bad the bullying and everything kind of got. He really flipped a switch and tried to kill this man. And then after that didn't work, he took an attempt at his own life at the age of nine. He had a chemistry set. He figured drinking the chemicals would do the job. Um, they were not strong enough, so he basically just made himself incredibly sick. And this was one of many attempts, I think probably over 30 attempts that he would take the rest of his life. So poisoning and attempts at his life became a theme for him. By the time Charles was in his senior year of high school, he unexpectedly lost his mother as well to a car accident. So... <sighs> Basically, at this point, he's lost the people that did care about him, and he's kind of left with these siblings that aren't very stable, and their friends and boyfriends and girlfriends that aren't stable either. And to make matters worse, he was so incredibly close with his mother, and the hospital, Mountainside, in New Jersey, where he lived... Um, refused to give her body back. I guess he went to the hospital and was asking for it and they said it had already been disposed of. So he couldn't even give her a proper burial. And again, he was raised Irish Catholic. He was very strong in his religion and that was a huge blow for him. So this kind of sent him into another spiral where he was just not doing well. So he never managed to really get past this and it sent him in a really bad downhill spiral. So he decided to forget about school, forget about all of that. And he went to enlist in the Navy and he actually was doing really great in the Navy. He passed his basic very well. He passed all the different psych evaluations that he had to take because he was going to be underwater in a submarine at least for two month periods at a time. And they have to really undergo very rigorous psych evaluations to make sure they don't lose their mind while they're down there. Um, as soon as he was actually stationed and placed in the Navy, he was put on a submarine where he was working with Poseidon missiles, something to do with the electronics behind it. And again, he was doing great. He was ranked up to petty officer very quickly. But unfortunately, more experiences from his childhood just kept coming back to haunt him. And the other crewmates started to bully him and haze him. Uh, and as soon as this happened, he kind of lost hope again that he could ever move on from these terrible points in his life of being treated badly. There ended up being a few incidents that forced Charles to be reassigned to a job that required a lot less of him. They pretty much chalked it up to him just not handling that high pressure job well um, because of these incidents that happened. They never really thought there was a lot mentally going on, just that he was under too much pressure. So he, so he was put on, I think, a cargo supply ship but unfortunately, the very first thing that he did once he was reassigned was attempted to take his life again. So this kind of started a pattern over the next couple of years of him repeatedly being sent to the psych ward in the Navy. And eventually he ended up being medically discharged in 1984. 
four at the age of 24 years old. So the Navy didn't work out for him and somehow he ended up in nursing. And I'm not quite sure how this happened. He explained his life as a series of him being thrown into uh, new things. He kind of, I guess, viewed fate as such a huge thing for him. He really believed that he was led in life into things that he was supposed to be doing. And interestingly enough, he ended up enrolling into Mountainside Hospital School of Nursing in Montclair, New Jersey, the exact same hospital that refused to give him his mother's body. He was wildly successful here though. It was very, very different from the Navy. He made friends pretty quickly. He was very, very intelligent. He ended up being elected as the president of his nursing class and he graduated by 1986 and immediately started working at St. Barnabas Medical Center in Livingston, New Jersey at the burn unit. Now he took to his new career with ease. If you know anything about a burn unit, it is very, very difficult. It is not very typical for people to immediately go into a chaotic environment like that, but he took to it with ease. He had even met a woman named Adrian while he was working odd jobs in nursing school to pay for nursing school and she ended up becoming his wife and the mother to two of his children. So it seemed as if things in his life were finally falling into place for him. He was finally heading in a positive direction. At least that's what it looked like from the outside because he ended up taking destruction into his own hands in the next few years. In the time after Charles married Adrian, she began to notice his behavior was strange. Obviously, we all have our interesting quirks about us, but his kind of went from strange quirks to increasingly alarming and disturbing behavior. He struggled with drinking, which is actually something I can't find a lot of information on, but it seems to play a huge role in a lot of portions of his life. I think even when he was in the Navy, he would resort to drinking mouthwash. Uh, but he had an issue with drinking and he had to convince Adrian that he stopped. But many, many times she would find it hidden, so she knew this was a constant problem. And he also showed some strange behavior when their first daughter was born. When he first met Adrian, I mean, head over heels, he was in love with her, but it was almost like when their first daughter was born, Adrian was completely put to, put to the back burner. It was almost like he had this new toy, this new interest and fascination, and Adrian was nothing. And this was, again, just another pattern that kept on repeating itself. He also was abusing their family dogs. Adrian had a dog that meant the absolute world to her, and he just wouldn't treat this dog good. And I can't quite figure out what he was doing to this dog, but he almost was like constantly punishing it for some reason. When she would go off to work, he would leave the dog out tied to a pole out back. Like for hours and hours at a time, it would scream and cry and be upset. And it got to the point that they actually came and took the dog away. And Adrian was shocked at this. She had no idea that he was leaving her dog out attached to a pole all day long. She ended up getting the dog back and it got kind of weird because he then started taking the dog at night to their basement and she would hear the dog crying from the basement and she was so scared of what she would find if she went down there that she never really did. She would just ask him to stop screaming it from the top of the stairs. So not only that, but they decided to get a puppy at one point and the puppy disappeared. And that's not too odd. Puppies are sneaky. They can get out really easily, but his reasoning and kind of explanation for how it happened was terrifying. Charles claimed that he decided to take a walk while their baby was napping. So he left their baby in the house to go on a walk. And he said the dog must have got out then, which also meant the door had to have been open. They were never able to find the puppy, and I don't know if Adrian was really connecting the dots yet at this point, but she did start connecting the dots when their neighbor showed up to their front door one day, hysterical. Their neighbor had a dog, I think a beagle, that would take itself on walks. So it kind of just roamed the neighborhood every once in a while. And they had noticed that the dog kept on ending up in Charles and Adrian's yard. So something in the yard was constantly drawing this dog in. And then one day, it just never came back from its walk. They searched for it and they ended up finding it nearby in an alley 
no longer alive, so they took it to the vet, they tried to figure out what happened, and this dog had been poisoned. And at this point, Adrian's kind of putting things together that something is not right. Charles has something strange going on, but she couldn't really prove it at this point. And little did she know that what was happening at his job was far worse than the horrors happening at home. And the horrors happening at home were terrifying. On June 11th in 1988, while working at St. Barnabas, Charles administered a lethal dose of medication to a patient. This is, that we know of, his first confessed killing. And it definitely was not his last. While at St. Barnabas, Charles continued to overdose patients with things like insulin, um, things that weren't considered street drugs. They weren't, they wouldn't set off any red flags, but they definitely were lethal if given in the right doses. His victim count reached quickly up to about a dozen patients before he ended up leaving St. Barnabas in January of 1992. Now, the hospital had started to notice that there was an alarming rate of deaths. All things like insulin overdoses, digoxin overdoses, which is a heart medication, um, you know, very bizarre things. I think lidocaine, he used like a whole bunch of strange drugs. And they also noticed that there were some IV bags that looked strange. And upon further inspection, they saw that these IV bags had tons of little pinpricks in them. Now, that's not very odd. That's how you often will put a drug in something like saline to go through someone's body. But it was way more than you would expect to see. And I think they even stumbled upon a hidden stash of these IV bags. So this ended up setting off an internal investigation. And I'm pretty sure authorities were even involved in this. And it led them straight to Charles. They had taken so many steps in order to have proof that he was in fact the one that was possibly overdosing these patients. But unfortunately, despite all their efforts, which even included putting up security cameras in the most bizarre places, they were never really able to find anything or catch anything that without a doubt proved Charles was responsible for the deaths of these patients. Now, at first I was really confused about this and I did not understand why it wasn't possible to figure it out. But apparently in places like the burn unit and places like the critical care unit, two of the places that he kind of bounced around from while working in St. Barnabas, the patients in these places have so many different issues medically. Um, they're on so many heavy drugs that between all of the drugs and all of their ailments, a lot of the times when these people would pass away, they couldn't figure out from what. They There was so much medication in their system from trying to keep them comfortable that it would have looked like an overdose um, a lot of the time. And then on top of that, because there were so many other ailments happening inside of their body, any one of those problems could have taken them down. So it was almost impossible. He was doing things in such a sneaky manner that it was just impossible to pin him. He left St. Barnabas to wreak havoc elsewhere when he realized they were catching on to what he was doing. Now, this is frustrating and this is going to be something that's going to keep going for the rest of this video and I can already see you guys in the comments now, you know, how wasn't he charged? I don't understand. These hospitals at this point in time, laws were very different and they were not properly legally protected. Um, they could have a lawsuit if they give a bad recommendation. They could have a lawsuit or at least be struggling from some sort of liability issue if one of their employees ended up overdosing a patient. The laws just weren't protecting anyone on any side of this equation, so hospitals often either were scared to report situations like this. There are just so many reasons why he was able to continue this pattern from here on. So one month later, Charles took a job at Warren Hospital in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, and he immediately went on to murder three women by overdosing them on digoxin. Again, the heart medication. So he was flying under the radar still. Now, the third woman actually had told her family that a sneaky male nurse, and those are her own words, 
came in and gave her a shot in the middle of the night. The hospital was told by this woman that this she received some random shot by someone she wasn't expecting and they kind of brushed it off, but sure enough, the next day she had died. So another example of, you know, the way that he worked. He would go when it was dark, he would go to patients that didn't know him, didn't expect to see him, but because there are so many people working in a hospital, he got away perfectly. Meanwhile, at home, Charles' behavior was still increasingly becoming alarming to the point that Adrian asked for a divorce, I think at the end of 1992 or the beginning of 1993. She had pretty much had it with Charles. She had connected many dots thinking that, you know, he was poisoning people or harming people, you know, her, their animals were disappearing, their neighbor's animals were disappearing. On top of that, he was threatening to take his life repeatedly. He pretended that he did at one point, hoping to get a rise out of her. He, you know, sprinkled pills all around himself and then laid in the middle of the floor and acted like he was dead. Um, so she just couldn't handle it anymore. It was kind of like emotional torture to her. So she left. And she made sure that she left before she received a surgery at Warren Hospital where he worked. This is how much of a suspicion she had that he was doing something very wrong. She expedited the papers as fast as she could. He was served in the hospital the day she went in for surgery and she made sure that he wasn't allowed anywhere near her when she was recovering, when she was back in surgery, because she told her lawyer that she knew if he had the ability of getting near her and hurting her, he would do it. This probably saved her life. Charles was forced to move out into a basement apartment in Phillipsburg where he continued to work at his job, but this really devastated him and sent him deep into his depression and on another downhill spiral and anger-fueled rampage. He even threatened to quit nursing, but the judge said that because he shared custody with his wife of their two daughters that he had no choice but to keep working so he could pay child support. So he was sent back to his work and unfortunately, this led to disaster. Charles was so emotionally damaged by losing another person in his life that was important to him that it led to him stalking another nurse. He had met a woman while being monitored in Warren Hospital for a attempt at his life and she got him. They got along really, really well. She struggled with depression as well, so they got each other on this whole other level. She went from helping him as a nurse to coming and visiting him on her off hours. She even helped him be moved to a facility that she believed would fit him better than the psych ward in Warren Hospital. And when he moved there, she showed up there as well with flowers and words of encouragement. So he believed that she had feelings for him, that she was falling in love with him and he knew that he loved her. Now, once he got out of the facility, he ended up back working at Warren Hospital and here he was able to see her all the time because she was a nurse. He would leave her gifts, hoping to win her over. And then he finally started expressing his love to her and she wanted nothing with it. And he wasn't quite getting that. So the day that he told her that he loved her, she avoided him the rest of the day. And then he ended up getting a call from her on again, off again boyfriend telling him to back off. And Charles was under the assumption that she was kind of being forced into this decision, that she really did care about him, but her, you know, on again, off again boyfriend was the one creating the problem. So he almost created this scenario in his head to where he had to protect her and check in on her. So that night, he took the 40 minute drive from his apartment to her home multiple times. He would drive all the way to her home, make sure her car was in the driveway, he saw a light on, but then he wouldn't understand why she wasn't answering his phone calls. But then he would panic that, oh, maybe what if she's trying to call me back now and I miss it? So then he would rush all the way back home 40 minutes. There would be no call, there would be no voicemail. So then he'd think, oh, well, maybe something's wrong with her at home. So then he'd drive all the way back to her apartment. He did this over and over and over again until finally he broke into her home and watched her sleep. So the next day she called him panicking, saying someone broke into her house, asking him if he knew anything. And he admitted to being the one to break in. 
Sure enough, within a few minutes of ending that phone call with this other nurse, police called him and told him to come and turn himself in. So Charles did turn himself in, but not before taking an absurd amount of Xanax. So his hopes were that there would be this really serious and dramatic event at the jailhouse where he clearly was overdosing and he would have to be sent to Warren Hospital and it would appear as if she had broken his heart and she would want to come and save him again. But it didn't work out that way for him. He ended up just really messed up on Xanax and was released from jail. He actually had to call his kid's babysitter to take him to Warren Hospital. And he pretty much figured at this point he would be fired. He had stalked a nurse there. He had overdosed again and ended up in the hospital. He had to be wheeled past nurses that knew him and doctors that knew him. So he thought he was gonna be fired, but they continued to schedule him, which really shocked him and allowed him to keep on killing patients. So by September, Charles was back at work and back at his murders. Right away, a 91-year-old cancer patient had reported to the hospital staff that Charles Cullen, who was not her assigned nurse, came into her room and injected her with something in the night. Now, doctors looked at this injection point. They did find it in her inner thigh, but they said that it wasn't an injection spot from a needle. It was probably just a mosquito bite, and they ignored it. But sure enough, the next day, she died. However, her son had been with her, and he raised absolute hell. He was actually in the room when Charles came in and he said that Charles came in, didn't look at him, had no expression on his face, just told him that he needed to leave the room. Now at first he just assumed it was part of protocol, but now looking back at it, it seemed super, super odd. Hospital in response knew they had to do something, so they decided to do polygraph tests on their nurses to see if they could pin anyone for this and somehow Charles managed to pass, so everything, again, just went out the window. But just like always, as soon as things started getting hot, it felt like people were getting too close, Charles left. And the next few years were just a very weird mess. Charles worked at two different hospitals in New Jersey for very, very short periods of time. One of them, he was fired after only a couple of weeks because of poor performance. This is probably a hospital again that knew he was doing something wrong, but didn't want to cause any issues. So they just let him go for poor performance, which was probably things like overdosing people. Um, I believe there were instances where he just wasn't giving people their medicine. There were instances where he was giving them the wrong medicine. There was actually a man that was supposed to go into surgery and before surgery, he was supposed to be on heparin, which is a blood thinner. And Charles just didn't give it to him knowing that this meant he likely would die in surgery. And sure enough, that is exactly what happened. Charles was just kind of an emotional mess. He had all of these issues between his divorce, between stalking someone, the charges and probation that he got from that. His murders were getting too sloppy for his liking and people were too tight on his tail. So he decided the best thing he could do would be to hop across state lines to Pennsylvania to continue. It was a different setup when it came to applying for your license as a nurse. Um, and unfortunately, Everyone from New Jersey was willing to give him a positive recommendation. So in 1998, Charles ended up securing a job at Liberty Nursing and Rehabilitation Center in Allentown, Pennsylvania. <sighs> now, this nursing home, again, was unfortunately a perfect place to start. He didn't jump right into a hospital and probably for a reason, Nursing homes have a hard time getting nurses to begin with and B, getting people as highly qualified as Charles was. So they didn't wanna ask any questions. They just wanted him to be a part of their staff. There was a man who had a halo device. And if you're not aware of what that is, I'm pretty sure it's when your neck is broken or um, you have an issue with the strength in your spine um, right at your neck and like at the base of your neck. And they basically, put this device in your skull and right in your neck and it holds your head up. And this man in particular did have a broken neck. Now, Charles believed that this man should not have been in a nursing home and needed to be in the hospital, so he took it upon himself to make sure this man was put in the hospital by overdosing this man on insulin, which I'm not sure if you are aware of one of the side effects of an insulin overdose, um, it's seizures. He sent a man with a broken neck into violent 
seizures. Liberty Nursing immediately knew something was not right. There was an overdose of insulin given to him and they started their own internal investigation, but it led them somehow, and I don't know how, to an entirely different innocent female nurse. She ended up being let go. She had to hire a lawyer. She had to figure everything out. And between her lawyer and her own investigation, they actually told Liberty Nursing they believed it was Cullen. They said, we think Charles had something to do with this. It wasn't me, I'm innocent. But Liberty Nursing didn't believe it. And she had to go and find another job and was accused of overdosing a patient that she never ever overdosed. Now, he basically got off easy at this point and decided to again try to overdose another patient. This time, however, he was seen by other employees walking to a patient's room, a patient that was not his own, with a syringe in his hand, and there suddenly was a scuffle within the room. Now, it's not that untypical for some patients, especially senior patients, I've worked in a nursing home before to resist taking their medication. Sometimes if they're struggling with Alzheimer's or dementia or anything like that, they can be confused and they will fight back. And at first, that's what people thought happened because this particular patient ended up with a broken wrist after Charles went in there. But after looking into everything, it's because this person was not supposed to get the medication Charles was supposed to give them. So Charles was fired but that's it. Nothing more was done. I don't know if they ever realized at this point that he likely was also the person who overdosed this man on insulin, but all they did was fire him. But somehow with more glowing references from more hospitals and Liberty Nursing because of their fear of a lawsuit, he went to work at a few more facilities with no problem and no questions asked. First, he worked at Easton Hospital in Pennsylvania where he only worked for a year. He did cause the death of a patient and that is all it took at that hospital for an internal investigation to begin. So he obviously left. And then he went to work at Lehigh Valley Hospital in 1999, but he only worked there for two months because again, another internal investigation after he killed another patient. And after this, he ended up at St. Luke's Hospital in Bethlehem. At first, his coworkers absolutely loved him. He came in early, usually a shift change. It would take about an hour and a half to speak about where all the patients were, explain what they needed, what they didn't need, what had been done. But he came in and was ready to go. Everyone loved when he was their shift change because they got out super quick. He was always willing to pick up shifts. He was considered a great hire. He wanted to work on weekends. He wanted to work nights. He wanted to work holidays. He was willing to pick up extra shifts. He was willing to do the dirty work. So that's another reason all these hospitals didn't question him and willingly brought him onto their staff. He definitely had his weird quirks about him though. So the hospital staff was kind of side eyeing him for a while. He would for some reason gather up all of the nurses chairs and put them in a room before leaving. However, they also noticed that there were large amounts of this random medicine going missing and it wasn't something that they used on a constant basis. I'm pretty sure he was working in the critical care unit at this hospital and it was weird. I mean, it, it would just all disappear overnight all of the medicine, but at first no one questioned it. They just replaced it and they moved on. But then something happened where everything kind of stopped and people started realizing something's not right at this hospital. The Sharps box, I'm sure a lot of you guys are aware of what that is. It's where all the medications and used syringes, needles go. It is a biohazard. Typically, people within the hospital do not take care of this. There are third parties familiar with biohazard procedures that will come and empty the Sharps box. Um, so it's not emptied on a super regular basis because it doesn't fill up that quick. But this one particular nurse noticed that it was incredibly full and she knew enough to know that this wasn't typical. She decided to open it up and just see kind of what was going on and she saw a ton, a ton of medication in there. She found a whole bunch of boxes of the medication that had been disappearing. It hadn't even been used. It had just been thrown away, which was odd. And then probably the most alarming thing was one particular drug that she found. I think it's called Vic or Vec. I'm probably way pronouncing that wrong or totally off. But the reason that this was alarming is that these bottles were empty. Now the medicine is originally comes in a powder form. So you have to 
take a syringe filled with saline, inject it into this vial, vigorously shake this up, take the medicine back out with a syringe, and then you use it. So someone would have had to have physically done all that work in order to get the medicine out of the vials, but what's even scarier is what the medicine does. In large amounts, this medicine will paralyze you. It makes it so you cannot talk, you cannot scream, you are in severe pain, you cannot move your legs, you cannot move your arms, you cannot move. So with all of that medication gone and being the critical care unit, there was no telling how many patients might be silently screaming and suffering in their rooms, but because they couldn't speak up, no one knew. Now, the nurse flipped out at this, knew something was wrong, went and told some other nurses, and they kind of decided to start their own watch. So they watched the medicine room and waited to see who would come in. And sure enough, people would come, they'd prop the door open while they got their medicine that they needed, and they would leave, and they would spend just a few minutes in there, nothing was odd. But then sure enough, Charles Cullen came in, and he went inside of the medicine room and he was the only one to shut the door behind him and he was in there for quite an extended period of time. And at this point, they knew he had something to do with it. But unfortunately, as soon as he had come in, their shift changed and they left so they couldn't wait to see what happened. But halfway through that shift, someone ended up overdosing. So it was pretty obvious he had something to do with it and by their next shift, Sure enough, that Sharps container was filled all the way to the brim again. However, the hospital didn't act as you would hope. In June of 2002, after figuring this out, they ended up giving him an ultimatum. They said he could resign willingly and be given a neutral recommendation. I'm not going to go into that. Um, or he could be fired and given a bad recommendation. So we all know what he is going to pick. He obviously picked to willingly resign to make sure he got a good recommendation despite being caught taking medicine that paralyzes people, um, you know, and, and he left. It was as easy as that. Seven of his coworkers disagreed completely with what the hospital did. They strongly believed that he had been taking this medicine to kill patients. So they actually went to the local DA, hoping to have enough information to press charges on Charles, but once again, they couldn't do it because being in the critical care unit half the time, there was no telling what exactly out of all the ailments and all the medicines ended up ending someone's life. So there was no proof. Now I have seen that St. Luke's did officially report his suspicious activity. However, the records from that are sealed. I've also seen that they tally that there were 69 suspicious deaths in the time that Charles was working there. 69 at this one hospital. And how many other hospitals did he work at? That is a terrifying number. But Charles just kept on going. By September of 2002, he started working at Somerset Medical Center back in New Jersey. So he knew that time that he could no longer be in Pennsylvania. He needed to jump the border again because they really got close that time. He ended up actually making a really good friend here. They hadn't really heard anything negative about him, I don't believe. And this friend that he made was named Amy Ridgway. She was a single woman. She was around his age. She was a beautiful nurse, a smart nurse, but she was known to be a hard ass. So she didn't have many friends while nursing. And Charles was probably one of the only people that really appreciated her. And so she respected that. She really appreciated him as well. Plus he was one of the very few men that she had been working with that didn't constantly hit on her. So they formed a really, really great relationship. They helped each other out. She loved the fact that he always showed up early. Once again, he was always willing to take extra shifts. He always had his uniform pristine. He was a great nurse in her eyes. So they pretty much became each other's shoulder to lean on. And she essentially became a distraction for him, a distraction that 
I'm assuming slowed down his killings potentially, maybe. I, I have no idea, honestly. I don't have enough of the information to know that. I just know that she was a great distraction for him. But unfortunately, Amy was very, very sick. She had self-diagnosed herself with a heart condition. Um, she had a lot of anxiety and she had a lot of issues with her heart and she was kind of keeping it quiet. I'm not sure why but he was the only person that knew about it. And one day she ended up collapsing while on the job. They worked the night shift and she immediately had to go into surgery to have a pacemaker put in. And this left Charles alone, which we know is not a very good thing. It spiraled his depression out of control. It was another person that he cared about that was potentially very sick. He might lose. And I believe 13 deaths of patients occurred after this, all the same as the ones before. But again, people were really catching on. Four patients had passed in a very short period of time, all from digoxin, and the hospital had already started their own internal investigation to figure out what was going on because it was blatantly obvious this time that the levels were astronomical. I believe one woman that overdosed from digoxin, I think she had been using it uh, for her heart therapeutically, but she had been off of it for 24 hours. They had taken her off of it. Her levels were at like one point something, but she died with levels of 9.8 or something like that. So astronomically high levels. It's not something that's produced naturally in our body. She would have had to have been injected with the medicine and not just a little bit, a whole, whole lot. So the pharmacist at the hospital decided to call New Jersey Poison Control for help with dosage calculations because they were trying to figure out, you know, what is going on? Is there some way this could have happened? How much would they have needed to, you know, how much would some have needed to give her for this to have happened? And this got an outside source looking into this. And the person from the pharmacy at the hospital that called poison control ended up letting it slip that multiple other patients had died from digoxin and also a couple of more from insulin and it was insane levels. So the director of poison control ended up calling the director of the hospital and stressed how serious it was that authorities be involved because they at this point had decided that these deaths were absolutely suspicious. They believed someone in the hospital had to have been giving these large doses of medications to the patients. Um, there was no way for any of this to normally happen. Even the smallest pharmacy slip up, there was no way. And the pharmacy had gone through everything, double checked everything, there was no way. This is a police matter. What we're wrestling with is, um, you know, throwing the whole institution into chaos versus, uh, you know, responsibility to, you know, protect patients from further harm. And um, you know, we have been trying to investigate this to get some more information before we made any kind of rush to, you know, judgment. If there is somebody out there that is purposely doing this to, to individuals at your hospital, we have a legal obligation to report this. Okay. So in their own investigation, they found that Charles Cullen was asking for drugs from the computerized drug dispensing machine at an abnormal rate. He was asking for multiple different drugs over the course of just a few minutes, all medicines that were not necessary in the amounts he was withdrawing them at, also, they were for patients that didn't need that medication and patients that weren't his own. They also noticed that he was constantly pulling patient records of patients that weren't his own. And he was ordering very bizarre blood tests for a lot of these patients as well. Now, despite all of that information, despite all of the findings of their internal investigation, despite poison control informing them that one of their employees was absolutely overdosing their patients, the hospital waited three total months to call authorities. In those three months, Charles went on to kill five more people and attempt to kill, I believe, one or two more. If they had called when they knew this information, 
they could have spared the lives of five people. Even when they finally contacted authorities about this, they still acted very nonchalant. They never referred to any of these patients that had overdosed as victims. They gave authorities a list, a short list of two names of people that they didn't say they considered suspects. They just said, oh yeah, like we've kind of been looking at these two people about like stuff, just very casual speak. They kind of threw it in the hands of the investigators and let it go. Authorities decided to do a background check on the names that they were given by the hospital. And Charles Cullen was one of the people on the list. And he quickly became the main subject of their investigation. They saw that he had a criminal record. He had been charged with breaking and entering and stalking a nurse. And they also saw that Pennsylvania had actually just called two weeks prior with very similar questions and concerns about the places that Charles had worked and the high death rate of patients, all from things like insulin, digoxin, um, just the same drugs basically over and over and over again. When New Jersey authorities finally contacted Pennsylvania authorities, things became very, very clear. Pennsylvania authorities told New Jersey authorities that they had been having this ongoing investigation that he had been looked into already multiple times, but they were having a really hard time proving that he was murdering patients at the different facilities he was working at. And part of the problem, part of the reason why they had such a hard time proving this was because hospitals were refusing to help to protect their own liability. They were so worried about lawsuits that they were okay not working with police to trap a serial killer. Somerset in specific actually told authorities that they couldn't give over records from the drug dispensing machines because authorities thought, you know, they have these machines, the machines record everything. If we can take the medicine that he took out and somehow make everything fit together and see if it correlates with the patients that overdosed, maybe we could catch him. This would be possibly enough evidence. But Somerset was like, oh heck no, like that stuff's gone within 30 days, you're, you're too late. So authorities were not gonna give up on this. They decided to go to the manufacturer to see if there was anything they could do, only to be told by the manufacturer that wasn't the case. Somerset lied. They should have still had all of the records. None of the records get deleted after 30 days. How helpful was the hospital in this investigation? How helpful was the hospital? They were very helpful by answering court-issued subpoenas. Uh, that was the extent of their cooperation. They didn't want to give you records that turned out to be crucial to your investigation. Yes, that's, that's correct. Do you think they tried to obstruct your investigation? They didn't try to help it, that's for sure. Authorities told Somerset that they had really started looking at Charles and because of this, Somerset fired him, but you better believe it's not because he was the subject of an investigation of an entire string of suspicious deaths in the hospitals. They fired him because they said he lied on his application for the job. Did you get the sense at, the, at Somerset, for example, that any of your colleagues, any of the nurses, any of the doctors knew what was going on? No, I mean, until, you know, uh, the day I was fired, I mean, nobody gave me any indication that anybody was suspicious. I mean, the weird thing about Somerset Hospital was is that they were planning on firing me the night before. So they let me work one more shift, knowing that they were gonna fire me the next day. So they let me work an additional shift with the suspicion that I had harmed patients, which I, you know, is kind of a bizarre thing to do. Did you harm anybody that night? No. So on October 31st of, I believe, 2003, Charles was finally fired. But now authorities had to find a very creative way to get to Charles because he wasn't at Somerset any longer. He likely was going to move on to another location of employment. And they decided to use his closest friend at Somerset, Amy Ridgway. Now, she presented a problem at first. When she found out he had been fired, she was livid because in her eyes, he was a great man, he was a great nurse, he would never do any harm, he did nothing to be fired, she was pissed. And when authorities confronted her and said, hey look, we've got this information, he's been overdosing patients possibly, she also didn't wanna believe it. She had been there for, he had been there for her so many times, she saw nothing but a great side of him, it was to the point where they actually had to show her all of the evidence that they had against him and she 
was shocked. She knew there was absolutely no reason ever that you would need this much medication unless you were trying to kill someone. They decided to use her to help piece things together, which was their original plan. They got all of the data that they could from the drug dispensing machine and they tried to correlate the different possible suspicious deaths. They also used her to speak to Charles to hopefully get some sort of confession. They put a wire on her and they had her meet him in different public places. And finally, on December 12th, 2003, she met with him at a restaurant and she basically straight up told him, I know you've been killing people. And she said his face immediately changed. And she said, you know, despite knowing this, I'm still here. I'm still here to help you. I want you to go turn yourself in. She said that she would go with him. And his exact words were, I'm not going down without a fight. That was pretty much enough for them to arrest him. But unfortunately, it was just on circumstantial evidence. They needed more and he was immediately not cooperating at all not like that suspicious so they again brought in amy to try to push him in the right direction and she ended up lying to him she told him that she was also being looked at for these murders as his accomplice pretty much and he didn't like that he didn't want her hurt he didn't want her pinned for something that she didn't do so it worked. Initially, he only admitted to one murder from Somerset and one attempted murder using lethal injection, but they kept on pushing and he eventually started to open up on his own. By December 14th, just two days after being arrested, he came up with the number of 40. He told authorities he believed he had killed 40 people in his career. A year later, in April of 2004, the only ones they were able to prove left him with 13 counts of murder for killing 13 patients and attempting to kill two others at Somerset alone. So this is only for Somerset and New Jersey. And in order to escape the death penalty, he took a plea. But this plea required that he work with authorities because he knew and he told them he knew there were more victims. He just couldn't remember a lot of the details. So they wanted to make sure he would work with them and continue to work with them to hopefully bring closure to the rest of the families out there that were now left questioning if their you know, loved one died at the hands of this crazy nurse. By November, he pled guilty to killing six patients in Pennsylvania and attempting to kill three more. We know at this point that these numbers are very, very small. There are a lot of people that speculate he killed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients. We know that at St. Luke's alone, they had about 69 suspicious deaths while he was there. And that is one of the very many places, he worked at over a dozen places, that he had access to killing these patients. More investigations continued and unfortunately he only remembered small bits and pieces of certain murders and confessions just aren't enough. So even the ones, some of the ones that he did remember, they just didn't have the proof to back it. I mean, he had been working for well over a decade, I think maybe like 16, 17 something years. And a lot of the hospitals had actually destroyed their records from back when he initially started working. So there was no way to prove even a lot of these murders that he was confessing to. So by 2006, the investigations pretty much stopped and his sentencing in New Jersey was complete. He was given 11 life sentences and no parole until 2403. He was also sentenced seven life sentences for seven murders in Pennsylvania, and he's currently serving his prison time in New Jersey. Charles said that he was sparing these patients. Uh, he said that he was preventing them from coding because he couldn't stand to watch attempts at saving someone's life. However, this is false because every nurse that ever worked with him he was like the code master. Every time a patient would code, he was always the very first one in the room, the very first one attempting to help them and resuscitate them and reverse what had been done. But unfortunately, he was what had been done to them and he knew there was no re reversal for it. Um, so him being worried about someone coding, he caused them to code. It's a lie. He said that he would watch people for days suffer when a lot of the people that he ended up killing 
were fine. They were just in the hospital for a, a small period of time. He also said that he wanted to prevent the hospital from dehumanizing their patients, which is interesting given what he did. But I honestly had that stick out the most because it makes me wonder a lot about what happened to his mom and that that's the first hospital that he ended up back at. It's where he went through nursing school. And to him, I believe what they did to his mom dehumanized her. I feel like that might play a huge part in why he ended up doing what he did. Aside from that, this ended up making a massive impact on Pennsylvania and New Jersey laws, along with 35 other states. Charles was so easily able to bounce from hospital to hospital because there weren't any laws that were requiring hospitals to report staff members in these sorts of situations. Um, and again, there was this massive lack of legal protection for pretty much everyone involved. Obviously, hospitals are required to report suspicious deaths, but it usually only happened when things were blatantly obvious because again, it could throw them into absolute chaos. As I said, Pennsylvania and New Jersey, along with 35 other states, ended up implementing and creating new laws after this. It was laws that helped employers honestly review their employees' work without fear of legal action. It also changed disclosure requirements. It helped to boost legal protections for healthcare facilities. And it also required that all health care professionals have a background check done as well as fingerprinting at their own cost to hopefully avoid situations like this in the future. And to know that a lot of that stuff wasn't a thing is a little unsettling. I'm happy, however, that the laws have changed. I am so heartbroken that this many people had to lose their lives, though, for these changes to be made. I feel like situations like this, we don't raise enough awareness on. When I did the podcast with John, we had a whole list of tips on how to keep yourself safe when it comes to medical crimes. And this isn't the only type of medical crime. There's fraud, there's, you know, all sorts of things. John's particular case for the podcast was a man telling patients he they had cancer when they didn't, just so he could treat them for years and bill them for everything. We tend to blindly trust a lot of doctors and nurses and hospitals and doctor's offices uh, because we see them as simply being there to help us. They are only there to help. And obviously, yes, majority of them are, but there's so much medical crime going on that I feel like we're just not aware of and we need to be a lot more self-aware. We need to research where we go to our doctors. We need to research the doctors themselves, research the local hospitals, be more aware about what is happening because our lives are literally in the hands of these healthcare professionals. Um, and... I know I, for one, was always someone that just blindly trusted. I was given so much medication as a child that I didn't need the amount of times that me as a middle schooler, I was prescribed Vicodin for no reason. Um, it's just crazy to me because I can just see so many parallels in my own life where I know there was something more going on and I just didn't think about it and I didn't protect myself. And so again, here's just another case and an example to look out for yourself. Anyways, that is all I have for today. Don't forget to go and check out my Audible link down below. It is www.audible.com forward slash Danielle, or you can text Danielle to 500, 500. Go ahead, start your 30 day free trial. Definitely go and pick up The Good Nurse. The Good Nurse, I will have that in bold right here because Ryder put in so much. It's the only way that a lot of these families were able to have their voices heard. A lot of the people that put their experiences into this book risked their lives, risked their jobs, risked so many legal actions potentially being brought to them in order to speak about what this man did and how he changed so many lives in such a negative way. On that note, you guys, I'm gonna go ahead and go. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to the story of these unknown number of victims at this point. Um, and yeah, so subscribe if you haven't already to become a part of the Howland fam and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye. What legacy will you have left behind, sir? A serial murderer, serial killer. You ruin the lives of your family, 
your children, and many people in this courtroom. You've bloodied and stained the medical profession. Absolutely abhorrent what you did, sir. And I still can't really comprehend it. A registered nurse who was supposed to be a caretaker took the life of my brother for his own personal, selfish, and twisted gain. Charles Cullen, you are a coward. I am very brave for standing here today, but you yet cannot even look me in the eye and face me. He finally can rest in peace. 